Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is the fifth lecture. So, uh, I'm sorry, so I did say it wrong. So, uh, but the title is correct. So, we want to talk about imaging today. And in, when we talk about imaging in uh, uh, scanning transmission electron microscopy, we are talking about aberrations and how spatial trans, uh, information gets transferred from the sample onto our detectors. So that's what we want to do today. Uh, on Friday, we will uh, talk about atomic resolution, STEM, and uh, structure determination, finding atoms, how to handle them, and so on. So today we are still on the process of getting all the vocabulary correct so that we can communicate uh, uh, efficiently. So, uh, whoop. again, as before, the video is going to be available on YouTube and all the notebooks and this lecture will be available or is available on GitHub in Sergei Kalinin's uh, um, yeah, account. So this is what we want to do today. We go briefly over the different parts of our microscopy. So what are Im which image formation techniques do we have? And then we are focusing mostly on which kind of information is preserved through aberrations and which one has to be changed, uh, has to be uh, investigated in more detail. If or to what extent can you naively interpret them? Um, that's a key thing. If we talk about image formation, we have different contrast from uh, mechanisms. Uh, we have diffraction or strain contrast. We have Fresnel contrast, phase contrast, and then we have C contrast. Uh, in STEM, that is what most people rely on or associate with STEM. However, you have all the different contrast mechanisms available to you. Uh, we actually have a few more. We have differential phase contrast and so on. So, uh, which is a phase contrast, right? Uh, diffraction contrast, if you go and do a medium angle uh, annular dark field detector, then you allow a certain amount of diffraction contrast and C contrast, true C contrast image, you only have when you have very, very large inner angles. So there's always a mixture of all of these. That's why we do image simulation when we want to be uh, interpreting, when we want to interpret the intensity of our images very accurately. So uh, that is the reason. So we have different contrast mechanisms and diffraction and phase contrast is most easily understood in high resolution imaging. Um, if you do a bright field uh, image in STEM, you get a phase contrast image. And so the information here is, is discussed in the same way, but, but it's maybe a little bit easier understood if you do it in terms of parallel illumination, okay? So what are the different imaging techniques? Uh, bright field. A bright field technique is, uh, my lectures, what I usually do is I put two uh, images up and say, which one is the bright field, which one is the dark field image. So it's most easily uh, discriminated by looking at the vacuum. If nothing is scattering, you have no dark field. So no diffracted beam is hitting the uh, vacuum uh, is, is uh, activated. 
And so it's going to be dark in vacuum, while a bright field will always be bright. So it's very easy to discriminate the two. And so now you understand also why these ones are dark field images. If nothing is scattering to high angles, then a ring detector will not detect anything, right? While a bright field will do that. So we can only use the in parallel illumination, the zero beam, the undiffracted one, and we get a bright field image. We use anything that is diffracted, we get a dark field image. Most, and this is also called conventional TM. High resolution TMs, that is um, a historic term. Uh, of course, we also do atomic resolution in STEM. So this is actually better termed phase contrast imaging. Here we uh, use the phase shifts within the samples and uh, the resulting diffraction and then the interference between them. In STEM, we have different annular detectors. These detectors can be segmented uh, and then we get, get differential signals as well. We are not going to go into the uh, sectored detectors, um, so, but it's easily extrapolated from, from our discussion here, right? So we have all these different signals, and as I said, so the bright field signal and the phase contrast image is basically the same. We have diffraction contrast, so we have a little bit of this in a medium angle dark field detector or even small angle dark field detector. And um, the high angle dark field detector should be high enough so that we have new contrast mechanism where we scatter to very high angle, which are then based on, on Rutherford scheduling. For the phase contrast, let's talk about our sample and say it's hit with a plane wave. This plane wave is modulated by our object. So now we have an object function. In Fourier optics, we go and we did that. Uh, we talked about it briefly in the, in the second lecture of this thing here, this lecture series. So we do a Fourier transformation. So we are in the back focal plane. In the back focal plane, that is where we convolute the lens aberrations to this object functions. So it's a multiplication here. Then we go with an inverse Fourier transformation back into real space. And we have still amplitude and phase here. But when we do the intensity, we lose this information. So in normal high resolution TM, we have starting from an image and we <clears throat> cannot go backwards. So what we have to do is we assume an object, get the object function, determine exactly what kind of lens aberrations we have in our microscope for what conditions we have, most everything goes in here. And then we can calculate back our intensity. So, we have the lens aberrations that are key. This key is uh, the key for understanding what kind of contrast you can get. So it's the key to understand what, uh, what you see and how you can analyze this. Let's think about it for a second, what happens in STEM. In STEM, you have that twice, basically. So you have the upper and the lower objective lens. And the top one is the probe forming um, lens. And you have an aberration there. So before you hit the sample, so now we come from this side and we go in that direction, we have an aberration. If we go past that on the other side, uh, we get a diffraction pattern. This diffraction pattern is also distorted a little bit by the aberrations in the lenses. However, 
that is uh, uh, not really significant and we usually ignore that. So um, in the high resolution image, we go from the object through a lens and in STEM we go the other direction. So there is a reciprocity theorem and actually tells you that that is possible. And of course it is because in uh, geometric optics, ray tracing, uh, it doesn't matter which direction you go. Significantly different are only the angles that you're using, right? So here we come in with a single direction, while in STEM we would, or in, in diffraction, we have all kinds of different uh, angles the electrons go through the um, lenses. Here again, it's the same thing. Uh, dynamic diffraction will be an important role to determine um, the exact object function. So the electron scatters and scatters again. Uh, this can actually happen on a single atom. So an electron can scatter multiple times on a single atom if it is heavy enough. So this is not something we can ignore. And in the EELS lecture, we already looked at that, right? So it happens elastically, it happens inelastically, and the combination of the two. So we have an dynamic diffraction effects here. So the dynamic diffraction effects will only do something to the intensity, not, however, to the angular distribution of the Bragg's peaks, and they make a kind of um, inelastic scattering makes a kind of uh, gray background in, in, in between the angles. If we look at this uh, phase contrast images, we get resolution. Uh, the question is, can you trust that? So that's what we want to explore. And if you're a seasoned electron microscopist, then they will tell you, uh, what was the defocus? What kind of microscope did you use? It could be the bright ones. So that all the atoms, it could be the dark ones. We don't know. Uh, that is the beauty of the C-contrast images. And that is the beauty of using other techniques together with C-contrast imaging, because that way you can actually uh, unambiguously determine where are the atoms and uh, what contrast mechanism do you have? Please note here in gallium nitride, we have a few uh, intensities in between the, what we would perceive naively as, as atoms, so the bright dots. Resolution. Uh, let's look very briefly in the resolution notebook. Oh, I don't even have it open. <laughs> let's open our notebooks. I have set. So it's under lecture five. We go to resolution. And we can open it in Colab. Resolution and magnification is something that is very easily mixed up by people who don't do microscopy. So that is uh, the first task if you talk to a machine learning person uh, who doesn't know anything about microscopy, I'm like you guys now, right? Uh, to talk and make it clear there's a difference between magnification and uh, resolution. Generally speaking, we want to have the magnification so that we have oversampling of the information with the limit of the resolution, right? So we want to have resolution over samples. Okay, now are we with the installation of our GitHub notebooks? So we have downloaded not yet everything. So here is PyTemLib. We really don't 
uh, need all of it. Uh, but uh, so here we install the different, as usual, the different packages that we have downloaded. And if you talk about resolution, you will talk about the Raleigh criterion. So it means how close can two objects be together in order to still be considered separate. So separation, uh, separatable. Uh, and that goes back to Fraunhofer diffraction. And if you talk about Fraunhofer detection, then you talk about the uh, difference of, of airy patterns, airy disk functions. And so we are talking about the Bessel function, which we get, of course, from scientific Python, SciPy. Everything is also related to our wavelengths. Lambda. So in a transmission electron microscope, we have um, wavelengths of about two to uh, five picometer in that range, right? Um, and we have an aperture radius. And so we want to see what can we uh, see here. Let's look at that, what this program does. So we have two features and clearly we can see, we can discriminate these two features. At what point is it not longer feasible to do that? So clearly here, if you don't know what your resolution is, you cannot longer discriminate the two um, area disk functions, area disk functions, so they have here some uh, oscillations in the tails. Uh, that is due to the aperture effects. And in the end, any kind of sample is an aperture. So we only let certain things through. So at which point can you separate them? And you already see that if you know your resolution very well, then you know immediately that these are two different features underneath this larger curve. So that is the key. And so that is called point resolution. When can you determine them by just looking at it? When do you have two easily discriminatable features? The other way is an information limit. Then if you know your resolution, you can get that back out. In 2D, Okay, so point resolution. This is given by this criterion. So it's uh, 1.2 lambda over the, the distance, gives you the angular resolution. And in our case, the angular resolution is 25 milliradians. So independent of magnification, if 25 milliradians is not a lot, obviously. So if you can, this, discriminate something by looking at two different angles, then this is the uh, angular resolution. In optics, the best thing you can do is you can possibly discriminate that there is a window in the space station. The angular resolution in contrast of an electron microscope, if you have a penny on the moon, you can actually discriminate the mint date, right? So the angular resolution is just so much better in an uh, electron microscope. Obviously you cannot look on the moon. Okay, come on. So here we have two features and in 2D, so that would be two atoms. They are clearly different. And if we reduce it, now we can first ex put them a little bit further apart. Obviously it gets easier and easier, but if we subtract that, we cannot. And that is independent of the magnification. Once the 
pixel size of your detector is uh, changing your resolution. That can happen, obviously. Then your resolution is given by the detector. And uh, so it's a combined resolution. And say Raleigh criterion gives you something that is just uh, detectable. While here you have an information limit. If you know that your atoms are round, obviously an oval will be um, two of these atoms. So this is the Raleigh criterion. And uh, the key thing is that magnification would not do anything to the angular resolution, obviously. So uh, except because we have a detector then associated with it. Key thing is the resolution in electron microscope, transmission electron microscope at uh, usual um, acceleration voltages is not limited by the wavelength. So that is always in the single digit uh, picometers. So we should be easily getting down to uh, very sub angstrom at any point in time. But the resolution is uh, dominated by the magnetic lenses, by the aberration of the magnetic lenses. So that is the key problem. And the way it is transferred through the microscope is in information theory, the transfer function. So that's what we have to look at these transfer functions, what are the different contribution to these transfer functions? And so that is what we will need in our analysis. Oh, I wanted to, that's it. So this is what we will need in our analysis of the contrast. And that is also what we need for simulation of images or other data. So that is gonna be key. The transfer function has several several different uh, ingredients. Uh, it's our aberrations itself with uh, the sign of them. Then we have uh, an aperture function. So angle limited, so you cannot get all electrons is onto your uh, detector. And we have dampening functions. This is a universal um, function. So it's for STEM, for any kind of uh, uh, information transfer. Uh, stereo has a transfer function, right? So, uh, and it should be uh, adapted to your hearing or the hearing of, of humans in, in our case, right? So, uh, Let's look at this transfer function um, and let's look at the different contributions. Let's go back to this one here. And then, oh, okay. So I had this earlier. Okay. Anyway, so uh, let's look at the uh, shared the focus. Uh, that is the, the focus that gives you a transfer function that is as close as possible to ideal. Uh, given the aberrations that you have and given the uh, dampening functions. Please notice that you can look at this in different uh, models. So you can look at that in uh, real and reciprocal space and then the, the language changes. And we will change backwards and forwards with the mathematics as well. Wherever it's easiest, we do it in real space or in reciprocal space. So. Anyway, so point resolution is obviously in real space. And so we have a the focus that makes this transfer function as good as possible. And so that's where the uh, aberration function is as close to minus 120 as possible. And the changes is uh, close to zero of the, with, with, uh, with the angle. So the spherical aberration is the key 
aberration in uncorrected microscope. The whole discussion uh, moves down in, in order of aberration, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a, uh, towards the end of this lecture. So in point source, we have our objective lens. And now in an ideal case, the sample is focused, uh, the, the rays are focused on the sample. Uh, and for um, magnetic lens, magnetic lens is having the converging uh, power is actually dependent on the inhomogeneity of the magnetic field. And that is largest on the higher angles. So the smaller angles get not deflected at all. They go through straight, straight. And the higher angles actually get converged uh, more. So we have two crossovers for these two different angles, the electrons go through it. So in an ideal case, uh, they would all converge on the same point. Uh, and so they shared the focus and the transfer functions uh, discussion, depending on that, will give you the smallest disk of confusion. And you can already see that depends highly on what kind of diffraction uh, angles you get through your <clears throat> through your lens. So uh, and and then the whole mathematics goes accordingly, but then the minimum disk, so the disk of least confusion is then half times the spherical aberration, and it is dependent on your maximum angles that you allow to get through that. Our <clears throat> aberration function that we in the moment only look at the spherical aberration, which is a third order aberration, and the defocus, which is a first order aberration, uh, say astigmatism and coma, any of the other first and second order uh, Operations we ignore in the moment, and we'll discuss them in the moment. So we only take two of them into account, and we have two different angular dependencies. And if we want to have that flat, then, then we have to have set as close as possible to zero. So we can get a, uh, a formula for that. And that is what Scherzer did. And then he calculates the focus depending on the spherical aberration and your angles. So here we have the Scherzer defocus or a third of the spherical aberration and the wavelengths. The point resolution is then defined by that. And I want to go into the contrast transfer function now and discriminate where all these different points here. So we were trying to have the contrast transfer function where this is as little disturbed as possible. So as flat as possible. So the first derivative should be zero. The first point then is uh, here where we have no information going through. And that is uh, the point where our Point resolution is there actually not exactly, so it's one over E of that. So a little bit less than the zero point here. That is our contrast, uh, our point resolution. And down here we have oscillations of our contrast. And this makes the naive interpretation of uh, phase contrast images so problematic. So if you have this changes in how the information gets transferred. You notice that the contrast transfer function is negative. So in shades of focus, all your atoms are naturally dark and the channels, so the vacuum between the atoms will be bright. So that's a negative contrast transfer function. 
And depending on the focus, you can shift this uh, relative flat portion through here, uh, and then you would have if uh, through focal series and you can reconstruct that by just taking that kind of amount out. Uh, in comparison, the contrast transfer function of the C contrast image of the high angular dark field detector is free of these oscillations. What it is not free of is a change of intensity. So it's not always the same contrast uh, the higher the angles in the reciprocal space, and then the smaller the distances, the less information you get through. And at some point, of course, it's going to be gone. Uh, immediately, you can see that you have more resolution in a high angle dark field detector uh, image than in phase contrast. Uh, Lord Raleigh already determines it, so it's an incoherent scattering uh, mechanism. And uh, so the non oscillatory part of the system is what makes it so convenient when you work on an electron microscope because you know exactly where are the atoms and where not, and then you can determine where your positioning is. So they are a bit more naively to interpret. But if you want to know exactly the intensity your atom should have, obviously you need now to do still some uh, simulations, but for naive interpretation, you already there. Do we want to say anything else on that? Not in this moment. So we have, oh yeah, we want to do, tell some. So that is a key, the sign of the key. Uh, and uh, you see these oscillations obviously die down. Obviously the stem information is dying down. Uh, that is due to the dampening functions. And so we will want to talk about that as well. So there are the so-called envelope functions. Uh, it also includes aberrations, something like the chromatic aberration. Let's go back and look at our spherical aberration for a moment that we had. If you have different kinetic energies of your electrons or different wavelengths, then also you have here a change in the focus depending on your distribution. With an electron energy loss spectrometer, you can determine your energy uh, distribution of your source. And then you can, uh, instead of having a single focus, let's say focus zero or whatever, right? You have a distribution now dependent on your uh, chromatic aberrations that, that we're getting. So that's what we're actually gonna do uh, when we are looking for that. So, uh, so we have this uh, damp chromatic aberration, we have dampening function. These dampening functions degrade the coherence and uh, degradation in the coherence. We will see how that affects our uh, resolution in, in STEM. So, uh, this obviously has direct. Okay, you hear me? 
question is, did I kill my virtual thing here? Can I go back to my camera or not? Okay. Can you see me? Not only hear me. Oh, I didn't say something. So the best way of, of seeing that is actually uh, pinning me to the microscope. Okay, we'll try it out. If not, then I'll I'll switch over to the to the other one to the to the normal camera. If that is a problem. So Sergey, already uh, please already allow me to share if that is the case. So envelope function. So that is what's dampening our information with uh, smaller and smaller distances or larger and larger angles in the reciprocal space. Uh, so we have a source. Uh, the source is 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 important. Uh, so we have a source dependence here for the coherence uh, and for the angular characteristic. So it's actually mostly the whole condenser aperture system. Uh, we can be limited by specimen drift. Uh, next lecture, we will go and talk about uh, um, getting, getting rid of that and or at least uh, minimize the effects and taking care of it. And then we have uh, specimen vibrations and uh, we have any kind of other uh, vibrations or instabilities here. And as I already said, we have a detector. So this is the problem. And here is the envelope function. In my uh, GitHub account, you can find actually uh, the notebooks to just redo all of those. Uh, so we have a Scherzer resolution. We have our oscillations. The more stable your microscope is, the further out you can see these oscillations. In the transfer, where we get our uh, absolute offset, the zero points will be visible as so-called torn rings. So they are uh, observable directly, and we will look at them and uh, analyze them. But you can see already that these oscillations here are very characteristic. The end of your intensities here in your diffractogram of an image will show you where is your stability and a degradation in the stability uh, environmental of the instrument will be very easily determined. And so you can determine your uh, information limit with that. And mathematically, it's just a multiplication and uh, the chromatic aberration is actually um, the focus value for us, or the focus spread. So the focus spread is also uh, can can directly be uh, associated with that, and so we also have one that depends on the uh, intensity or the the current in the objective lens. So how strongly you uh, side it. So, energy distribution and then whatever energy distribution you get from the uh, instabilities of your acceleration voltage. All of that can be measured. Uh, and then you can of course calculate your uh, information limit that is given by that. Uh, so, Coherence so of the source is important. And then we have an angle characteristic here. So the larger the angle, the smaller will be, the, or the stronger will be the dampening that you take with you. Um, and that is also focus dependent. And uh, so we can, we have different influences on that, uh, two different major aberrations that we can, in one case, uh, vary. 
and in the other case with our uh, microscope. With aberration correction, this all moves down the line to the last significant uh, aberration. And you get similar things. So what do we do? We get an image, doesn't matter which one, and you get a diffractogram. So that's what all microscopists do. They cannot judge any kind of image by just looking at it. You have to do a diffractogram. And here we see the diffractogram uh, of, huh. by now you should really know what kind of image that is. If you get a diffractogram like that with tone rings, so it must be a phase contrast image. So you can already determine phase contrast image mode in your, in your uh, from your diffractogram. You see the tone rings, you see that uh, you have different foci because the tone rings are, so the zero uh, parts of the transfer function go at different angles or momentums for two different directions. That's what we call astigmatism. You get closer to focus, you get something weird like that. So if you defocus more, you get uh, these kind of rings and you can judge immediately what's going on. So this obviously wouldn't be uh, a well-aligned microscope. What you can do is you can shift the sample and then this way is how we determine the information limit. So you see, we get, we introduce some amount of instabilities by shifting the sample very rapidly. And so we shifted it in this direction. So we have now our periodicity in that direction. So we can see how this instabilities uh, influence uh, our information in the images. And so the last lines that we can see, we would make profiles through that, that gives us our information limit. It's a very easy and uh, straightforward way to determine that. In a crystalline specimen, we would look for say Bragg peaks, and usually we look for the largest Bragg peaks. We go from one to the other one, which so that we have the largest distance through center. We do two over this uh, uh, reciprocal lengths, and we get our resolution. Please note there are two different uh, conventions for that. One is the physical one and one is for microscopy. Um, we just want to do that and divide it and know what kind of crystallographic uh, planes it could be. So in physics, you have an additional factor of two pi that would be uh, playing a role here. So depending on how you calibrate uh, that, you, you have uh, differences here, but for Microscopy standards, we just uh, ignore the two pi kind of position uh, factor. And so the two pi was introduced to show that there is a circular dependency of the waves, right? So simple analysis, and we did that already. What are the distances of the spot? So we get the resolutions. Are there any aberrations? Now we have some amount of information here. Uh, and we see we have a small astigmatism problem. We also have resolution only in one direction and not in the other one. So there is a little bit of loss of information in the one direction or the other, could be instabilities, sample drift, uh, what's the other? So we see the defocus, we see the defocus because we have some amorphous materials in here. And that is what we see here. So we are very close to Scherzer focus. And 
did anybody mess with the image? Did they do some Fourier filtering that they didn't tell us about whatsoever? And you can see that here too, because nothing is happening, right? So the full information is here. So that is a raw image as it comes out from the microscope. Uh, we can do different uh, Fourier filtering. So we can do a low pass filter so that we get rid of all the high ones out, or we can do um, more sophisticated one. Whatever we do, we should always test that, and we will do that in the notebook. Um, and we can make really weird uh, structures with that. Okay, and then we have the adaptive Fourier filters. So that's what we went through in lecture two. However, we can do a lot more with that. Uh, and uh, we will look at that in detail. So we did this one here. The same analysis is done in C contrast imaging. And the key thing is, is that any kind of drift will change your Bragg peaks now because you have different speeds in the line versus um, in, in the, so within the row or in the columns, you have different scan speeds because you start, as we said, historically, probably from how we read and write from top left to the right, in your case, the other way around. Um, so we scan our beam depending on where we are, we have a convergent beam electron diffraction pattern. And so from this electron beam, from this uh, convergent beam pattern, so the C bed pattern, we cut out different intensities with our angular or disk detectors. And in C contrast imaging, we use a high angle annular dark field detector. Scattering to very high angles means we are having an intensity due to the Rutherford scattering. And so if we make a line scan across here, this is Gallium Marcinet, it's a very early image. <laughs> I must say it's, a, it's an older slide here. Uh, so we see that the left of these atoms is a little bit less intense than the right one. So we have contrast according to the atomic number C squared. Okay. Now it depends the squaredness, how close to atomic number squared is that. That depends on your inner angle. Did you only allow Rutherford scattering? If you reduce that, you have diffraction contrast. So you have problems here. Uh, and we also know now that the closest the atoms are, the intensity goes down. And so that might not be longer very uh, easily. Uh, the, the, the contrast changes with, with our transfer function. The beauty of the C contrast image is that you can use uh, the electrons that are scattered to uh, very small angles. You can do eels with them simultaneously. You can do bright field imaging, which is a phase contrast image. You can do medium angle, which is a diffraction contrast. So you have different options here and you can do segmented uh, detector where you can then determine uh, electric fields, magnetic fields whatsoever. Uh, the idea of course is you have different signals. You want to put them all together. That's where the machine learning comes in. So we don't only want to do a single thing. We want to collect different signals and put them together so that we get to a very, a uh, reliable result for our structures, right? So what do we do? We form a very, very small probe. Uh, you can see this is an old slide. Um, so sub-angstrom uh, probes are now uh, standard, right? So depending on what kind of acceleration voltage, with 60 kV, that would be a brilliant result, right? At 300 kV, um, you didn't align your microscope very well, right? So that's where we are at this point in time. Um, so it's incredible. So we have this very small probe and we scan it in a rectangular pattern. 
across our sample. Why is it called incoherent scattering? Uh, that's a funny thing. Uh, what you first do is, and we will go into that a little bit more, you need a very coherent source and an aperture so that your area disk function is pointed uh, and you have a very small probe uh, shape. So the probe diameter should be very small. Now we go through the sample and we scatter to very high angles. And this very high angle scattering can only be done with scattering at phonons. So it's a thermal diffuse scattering. And uh, in the simulation lecture, we will learn how we uh, want to do that, right? So we will be really scattering it at the phonons. And so that is an incoherent scattering event. And so the signal, the object function is determined incoherently and not with the phase contrast image, a coherent one where you have an interference pattern and a phase contrast image is actually uh, a hologram with very low angle resolution, but it's still a hologram, right? And therefore we have in C contrast an intensity that is somewhere around the atomic number squared. So we have chemi chemical information uh, while CC dependence of our high resolution image is not. And that is for very thin specimen. So the intensity is directly related to the uh, linear dependent on the uh, thickness within uh, limits for C contrast image. And in the high resolution image, we have our rocking curve. And this rocking curve um, is uh, an oscillation of the contrast backwards and forwards. Uh, the key thing is we have two different detections. So one is parallel, one is serial. And so doing them together is often beneficial because you, you see contrast to know what the atoms are doing. And then you can do a parallel uh, image to know where exactly they are. It's not done very often, but that's where we are talking about opportunities with machine learning. Okay. Austin is not warning me that I'm not off anymore. So I'm, apparently I'm still on. Um, so what do we need? We need a TEM, we need a scanning unit to move the beam and we need a high angle annular dark field detector. Are we in time? Okay, so we have to move on here. So our intensity is then in a high angle dark field detector, uh, the object function, and uh, then it's convoluted with our probe. And if we know the profile file, we can already do a lot of our image interpretation in, in C contrast image. Uh, let's go through that a little bit faster because, uh, so we talked about many of these things already. Now let's talk about lens aberrations. That is something we need. Uh, in, in an ideal case, all the rays of the electron uh, microscope uh, after the lens meet in a single point. That is the Gaussian image point. And so, uh, it's a big focal plane. So all of them go through this lens and meet exactly here. Uh, any kind of deviation from that. So, and that means that all of the rays lie on a sphere and any deviation from the sphere-like uh, shape will show us uh, a deviation from uh, our back focal plane. And we can look at that as an aberrated wave front. So instead of having a sphere, we have something aberrated. And the aberration function is the deviation from the spherical perfect sphere from what we have. Uh, so this is the aberration function. Uh, 
and we will look at the coordinate system in reciprocal space. Uh, I will use both the uh, reciprocal space, which is um, basically a complex number, uh, or in polar coordinate, so distance and an angle from, from uh, an x-axis. In the notation of Krivenek, uh, we have uh, zero order operations, so that also shifts. We have first order, so that is focus and uh, astigmatism. Second order is coma. Coma is uh, introduced by not going through the objective lens uh, along the optic axis, but under some angle. And uh, we have something called threefold astigmatism uh, in a C contrast image that is very well aligned, which is an aberration corrector. Uh, your atoms will look a little bit triangular, so you can fix that. And then the key thing is the spheric aberration, C3, zero. Uh, and uh, then they go on and on. What they do is a perfectly nice flat plane wave will kind of warp in all kinds of different uh, ways. And they are uh, symbolized here by Andy Lupini. They follow uh, whichever one you're using, uh, conventions you're using, so always follows the same kind of convention. So it's dependent on the angle, so the, the distance in polar coordinates, and then uh, also the distance from the center in, in the reciprocal space. And then this angle here uh, is the angle from the x-axis. And so we have a cosine and sine contribution, and we have an order this uh, uh, n is the order of the aberration. Okay. And then the whole operation function looks like this, and we will see that a lot of times in the notebooks here. And if we go back and only select uh, the spherical aberration, we are back to our whatever we got in uh, with our Scherzer analysis. So just back to that. Uh, and the wave fronts now no longer are on a nice uh, spherical pattern, but have some kind of deviation. And then that causes this disk of least confusion here that we're using to image. Spherical aberration correction or any kind of aberration correction depends on the multipoles. So uh, the quadrupole will correct uh, astigmatism. You need a pair of them. And uh, octopoles or sextopoles have actually a negative spherical aberration. And so you can correct with that. Then you have the problems that the next aberration is killing you and the next and the next. Uh, so modern aberration correctors are now correcting up to fifth order, optimized for the seventh. So that's where we are in the moment. The way we do it in STEM, basically it's very hard to get something very round. The idea here is you take two octopoles and a few quadrupoles, and you try to make a line in one direction. Then you make a line in the other direction. They would be here and you combine them and you get a very nice spot. So this is what we are trying to do. And again, we are trying to combine different techniques and face contrast images. They are taken in one shot. So any feature is washed out if there's any kind of uh, drift or instabilities, but uh, the uh, distortions are very minimal and the minimal ones can be uh, determined so that you know exactly where the atoms are, what kind of atoms uh, there are, we can determine in, um, in STEM. Or you wait for the image stacks, that is in lecture six, where we will talk about that and then we do the um, strain analysis in, in STEM images. 
Okay, so this is the lecture part. Uh, I went through the aberrations relatively quickly because what we're gonna do now is we go through the whole thing again, but this time we're going through that. Okay, let's. Lecture five. Let's go through face contrast images. Again, face contrast images is your bright field image. And we open it in Colab. I would encourage you to do the same. And what we're gonna do is we are running the, to install in this environment all the different packages which we then will load in the next one. Uh, so we want to do a Fourier analysis of the phase contrast images. So we want to go a step beyond what we did in the adaptive Fourier filtering lecture two. Uh, we want to understand more about what's going on Okay. still doing stuff. Uh, so we want to know exactly what information can we get out of there and how, what kind of uh, experimental conditions do I want and uh, for, for our, for, for a good, uh, experiment with the maximum of information that we are going to get. Okay, so let's, after downloading the packages, we install that, we got it. And as before, oh, yeah, I forgot something. I have to download my uh, two images here in Google Colab, you can look over here. Now we have an example data and it's a nice, as a nice thing of Colab is that you have a very nice um, content here. So we're here at load an image. We can run it again with our example data and I run the first one. Um, and I'm not even, last time we were going through that, we were looking at it, blah, blah, blah. Oop. Ah, okay, we shouldn't only select it, we should select it as main. Okay, if you cannot use your own uh, software, maybe you shouldn't give a lecture. That's an understandable <laughs> thing. Okay, now, anyway. So uh, we selected here, we selected as main, and then we load it. And if we don't have anything loaded, obviously it cannot show anything. And what we see here is our diffractogram. I told you, first thing is look at the diffractogram and I'm doing it, okay? So now the next thing is, uh, in Matplotlib, if you select say uh, area selection, you can actually change that here in your, uh, uh, color bar. And let's look here a little bit closer. We see our torn rings. We have two torn rings. Then we have a broad band here. And this is where we have rack reflections. So we have two kinds of information here. And we understand that now. One is on our aberration. So it's information on our instrument and the other one of our sample. So here are rack reflections, and we want to separate those out and use it create, uh, to determine what kind of information content we have. We want to detect the spots. Again, ah. let's make it a little bit brighter here. So that you guys see what I'm doing here. Actually, I'm not doing anything. Let's say computer do it. So 
we have this blue uh, red spots here that we saw what our different uh, Rex peaks from. And in the background, we see our cone rings, which give us our aberration function. Do you see how far out my information limit goes? I don't want to throw that away, right? So, but I know that there are oscillations there. And so the question is, what can we do with that? Uh, I can do a Fourier filtering. We did that before. We do an adaptive Fourier filter and we got a nice image, noise free. We can publish it and we tell them we did an adaptive Fourier filter. That's okay. And of course, in order for us to be sane, we want to see what did we do? Okay, we did a uh, Fourier filtering here. Uh, and did we miss any kind of information? Uh, to zoom in quite a bit before we see something. Okay, the only thing left is high frequency noise in these images, right? So that's good. No information was lost. We got all the information. And so now we analyze it. Let's do it like the uh, theoreticians, right? They have a crystal structure and then they look what kind of symmetries they have. Let's do the same thing. We have a rotation matrix. We rotate it and see what we get. And it tells us we have a two-fold symmetry, we have a three-fold symmetry and a six-fold symmetry. Uh, so it's hexagonal. Graphene, it's uh, zinc oxide. Uh, so both of them are having three or six volts. And we can also look for mirror symmetries in these spots. We have them, right? Why not? And we see there is no mirror symmetry in this diffraction pattern, uh, that is not consistent with any kind of crystallography. So it means we have to have two materials here, and that is obviously what we got. Uh, I load the structures of two materials, graphite and zinc oxide, and I have my experimental parameters, so I do it at 200 kV. Um, I have high resolution image, so it's a convergent, no convergent beam. I have something that is called an excitation error. So it gives me how many peaks I will have. It's related to the thickness. So we'll talk about that as well uh, in the 4D stem part when we do diffraction. Uh, and now I calculate my scattering of that and I overlay that. Here. Okay. Oh shoot. I hope I did that in my okay. Let's see. And in polar coordinates, I can then determine the uh, distances. And I see I have two different distances. Well, let's make it a little bit brighter here so that you guys see what I'm talking about. Doesn't come across very well. Okay. So I have the red ones from the graphite or graphene. I have the uh, zinc oxide ones. And they have different distances. Obviously, they are six-fold with uh, uh, six mm uh, symmetry here. It's two mirror planes, uh, two different uh, materials. But together, they didn't have that. They uh, have no epitaxial relationships that we can see. And uh, so now we have actually discriminated the different spots by their crystallography. So now we can look at only the zinc oxide, only the graphite if you want to. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I just look 
it's a deviation between the experimental spots and the crystalline uh, uh, and, and, and from the simulation. And I get a distortion from that. And as expected, the distortion is minimal, but not zero, right? So in the one direction, it's basically zero. In the other direction, not. So uh, if I know that and I have the same imaging conditions, I can uh, get rid of that. And I do that, of course. This is all the information we have in the Bragg peaks. It works exactly the same way in a C contrast image, whatever you have, right? So this is what is different in a bright field image with, with a phase, phase contrast okay, is that we have this tone rings. I should, I should do that again. Ah, don't have that here. Okay. So we have these tone rings that we see here. And I do a radial summation. So basically, I take the whole image, go into polar coordinates, and then just sum it over all the different angles. And I have these tone rings here. Since I know that the zero points, Okay, think I'm back. Get me back. Okay, I'm not sure where I guys lost you, so I start over here again. <laughs> okay, uh, so I choose the contrast transfer function that has the same uh, zero distribution as before. Uh, and it should be on, right? It's an old one. And you can see why I chose this specific contrast transfer function. So I have a pass band here. Oh, where am I? Here. here. I have a pass band here. I have good uh, transfer of my information, and that is exactly where I have my zinc oxide. So graphene is in the oscillatory part, which is heavily damped, of course. So. Uh, but our microscope is very stable, so this information limit goes out very quickly. And then even at here in this determination, we have the zinc oxide. So the green ones are the angular positions or the, the specific space uh, distances of our reflections. And then we have sorted them basically now by graphite and zinc oxide. And we can see why I did this uh, uh, stronger defocus. So that is called a uh, second scherzer. I would encourage you to do another image uh, at some other point if you want to. So here we just see, just don't just use your, uh, your Fourier transformation, your diffractogram uh, as just looking at it. <clears throat> you can analyze it, you can do it, in a, you can analyze it very quantitatively and you can get your distortions out of that very uh, easily and you can correct for that, okay? So, um, we can do something similar with the uh, C contrast images. Let's go and look at the second uh, 
Okay, that was not correct. So we are in lecture five and we go for the Ronchigram. The Ronchigram is something if you do STEM, you will do. There's no way not to. Uh, and if there is a way to do it without the Ronchigram, just don't do it, right? The Ronchigram is really uh, your friend. It will give you all the information you need and uh, it helps you with focusing and with, with everything. So again, we install all the different, we, we download all the different packages here that we need additionally to what's already there. And then we will install them. While we are waiting for that, I want you to uh, Let's uh, make, a, make a short introduction of Zero and Shigram. In principle, okay. In principle, uh, Rontigram is a shadow image. Originally, it was used in uh, optical uh, imaging, and you just bring a knife edge very close to the back focal plane of your lens. What we are doing is we are using a thin amorphous material and we get that, uh, we look at, the, it's a shadow image of that and we can determine our aberrations from that and we can correct that from that. Uh, we want to express our specimen as a two-dimensional potential. And we want to have as little as possible electron specimen interaction. So we think this should be very thin. The same thing, Fresnel diffraction, we, we don't do any of that. So we, we uh, look for a very thin specimen and we shouldn't have any Bragg diffraction because it is amorphous. Any kind of Bragg diffraction will uh, screw that up. Our analysis, so we have downloaded, I have downloaded everything, now I can install it. Again, our different uh, aberrations that we want to look at. And so you can determine all of those from our Ronchigram. This is the formula. Uh, so the theta is actually a distance in reciprocal space. It's also an angle, right? So it's, uh, but I should really call it rho or something. So that makes it clear. And then in reciprocal space, we have an angle and that is the phi. So we do it in polar coordinates. Uh, we will see that you can do the same thing also in uh, X and Y in reciprocal space or U and V, uh, uh, which is then can be expressed as a complex number, which makes some of the mathematics easier. The whole tie can be done with very few lines. So that is the one where we are using to make our aberration function. And with an aberration function that is very well aligned, what we want to do is we want to create a very large coherent patch in the reciprocal space. So that's an infinite magnification and then of an amorphous material that gives us an image of our coherence and any kind of um, aberrations, any kind of instabilities will kill this coherence. So that's why we want to do that. So we can look at that. If we have a convergence angle of three, and this is our condenser aperture. So the aperture, probe forming aperture that we want to illuminate coherently. And coherent, as good as it gets, is just one, right? So all the have one and everything else is zero. 
And if you do a Fourier transformation of that, we get a prof profile. Uh, if we zoom in here a little bit, we see the area disk functions that we get. So the area disk function is just a Fourier transformation of a disk in Fourier space. So if we make it larger, 30 milliradians is what we normally are using uh, in an aberration corrective microscope, our disk gets much larger. And our spot, well, where is it? If you're on your own worksheet, you can of course zoom in. And that's a nice thing about uh, this kind of view. You not only have now a smaller probe, much smaller, right? But you actually have more intensity. And so the key thing is, uh, and the intensity was something very important that we are learned around, uh, in, the, in the last lecture, in the EELS lecture, as was the one before. Uh, so that's what we are going to do. So if we calculate now the Ronchigram, we want to get a lot of intensity in a very, very small probe. So that uh, technical term is called brightness. So we want to have as bright as a, as a beam as possible. And in the end, we don't care. As long as you know how much intensity you have and you have enough of that, that is what we want to do. Let uh, the manufacturer worry about that. Uh, uh, Ronchigram is actually a transfer function, right? So we are just using our uh, operation function and an aperture function. And we are uh, using on top of that, So we do that and then we convolute that with a, a potential that's here and we just make a noisy image so we just have a random distribution of intensities and we filter it out a little bit so that it is not too high of a frequency of a noise so that's what we get. Everybody gets it a little bit different, but uh, say spatial frequencies in here should just be uh, high enough. And so if we do this convolution, well, we need to print operations so that we know what we were doing. We get a Ronchigram. Ronchigram, so we have something that looks like an image in the middle. Then we have a wheel-like structure. And then we have something that looks like an image out here as well. This image obviously has a change in magnification. We will discuss all of that. So that's the key of this thing here. Uh, we have a relative. So we want to look at the different aberrations. And here we have now less of a defocus. Let's change the defocus to something larger, something like a thousand. And we get civil like structures that we had before at 109. We get something that is looking much more blobby, but you see there is still some kind of features in here. We want to have much less of that. So if we go to minus 90, let's get rid of this stuff. Which for our microscope is about the uh, Scherzer focus. We see we get something very, very blobby 
and we must be on something with a higher um, thickness and lower thickness on, on here. So it depends a little bit on which uh, kind of uh, random distribution you have. Okay, so this will be a Ronchi gram focus. And so you can see we have very coherent part here. So it looks very blobby and it looks in the microscope exactly the same way. You cannot mistake that, okay? So, and that is the uh, diameter of, or the size of the aperture that you can use now to form a very uh, small probe. How does it look if you have some astigmatism? Uh, that is what we first do. So let's put, where's my mouse? Uh, in the A direction, let's put 200 nanometer of uh, astigmatism onto that. So we have clearly a change here, right? So we have something that is changing our ronchigram. If we go a little bit more in defocus, don't know, change something to a few hundred in the defocus value, then you can see this oval structure with a lot of things in between that are streaky. So very clearly a strong astigmatism. Any of these different aberrations that you can enter here will have an effect, but because we have a strong uh, C3, right? So this is two times, uh, 2.2 times 10 to the six nanometer, so 2.2 millimeter. This is very, very uh, uh, bad aberration. So it's a non-corrected electron microscope. So we'll see that how it changes with a different one. Uh, let's get rid of this again. Go back to a more normal aberration. Because in uh, an FEI instrument or GOL instruments, they will talk about face plates. And the face plate is basically a ronchigram without the disturbances from your uh, aberration. So we have small part here. Uh, generally, they block this part out um, where the uh, strong oscillations and the non physical uh, parts of the uh, Fourier transformation come in. So the periodicity of the Fourier transformation. The next thing is we want to go in strong under focus. Do that. Let's go back to about the thousand. Right. And we want to look at the different magnifications in this ronchigram so that we understand what we are seeing here. Ah, okay. Here it is. Um, so it's a Hessian matrix. So we have the uh, double partial differential of our aberration function that we're using. Uh, for the few aberrations that we are using, we don't have to do much. And we're using that. And then we can calculate from that the magnification where it's uh, infinite. And we get to these two points. Uh, if you want to read about that, there'll be at all. We're uh, doing that for you. And so if we do exactly that, we do the uh, SN matrix, we come up with two infinite magnifications. And that is what we have here. Right, so we have outer one, an axial one, so and then the radial one. So that makes this V-like kind of structure. In the center, 
we have a change in magnification. So this is an infinite magnification, right? So two infinite magnifications. And basically what we do is we collapse these two infinite magnifications into one in order to get a very high coherence. So that is in focus. I'm not sure what's going on in the chat. So, okay. So let's look at the geometric origin of the circle. So there is a geometric um, um, so, um, explanation associated with that. In an ideal uh, microscope, all the rays are meeting back in the focal plane. And so all of them are uh, All the rays are in principle, if it's an infinite thing, would be on a sphere. For us, it's it's a circle in, in 2D. Uh, if you have the radial rays, two of this, and we are in, in strong under focus, as you can see. Uh, it, here's the sample, right? Here is where they meet. So if we have the outer rays, not too far out, a few of them will actually be meeting exactly at the sample. And so the focal plane is here. And if you remember what the ray diagram say, it's U over V. So you divide by zero, right? So the focal plane is zero. So you have no magnification, uh, infinite magnification for this rays. And that's what will give you the gill rise to this uh, radial one. The axial ones are further out and they actually will collapse all the way in to the center of that. So uh, from the honoring uh, and they will put the focal plane again out here. So in one case, it were two rings that were meeting and so you get uh, this V-like structure, while the uh, axial rings will be from just one distance from the center that so meet in the sample, plus, of course, aberrations. So they have a certain distance, and then we make this larger ring. So that is the geometric explanation for those. Uh, so mathematically was the Hessian matrix and uh, geometrically, it's just the infinite focus of that. And uh, if we do the same thing now with a little bit more aberrations that we now have corrected, uh, I go into, um, Mathematically, it's uh, uh, challenging to do that in radial uh, distribution. It's easier was easier for me to do that in uh, complex numbers. So I do the same thing and then, okay, we are not going through the mathematics here. Uh, if you want to, uh, so we do the different double partial derivatives, derivatives here and uh, then we can calculate them. And now we get a Ronchi gram. And we load aberrations from uh, an electron microscope. I modified them a little bit so that we have some kind of nice aberrations in here. And this is the face plate of that. And we want to use. Uh, aperture that is that big right and we calculate now our Ronchigram together with our Hessian matrix and you see things get a little bit weird and complicated which part is now the axial one and which ones are the radial ones? 
uh, actually we can help that. We can go and look at this kind of lines and do that in uh, polar coordinates. And then we just make one, the bottom part, this one will be our radial, and this one will be the axial aberrations. And then we can color them on our image and uh, do that. Okay. Again, the idea is to converge them together. Let's see what happens if we do that with a different defocus. So the defocus we had here is 50, do that at zero. We just had to do the last one, obviously. Okay, big mess, obviously. That's exactly what we want. So we want to have them collapsed and uh, uh, not longer very easily discriminate uh, to discriminate which one is which one. So if we do the same thing with uh, even larger one, so we had 50 before, if we go to something like 150 defocus, 200, pick your defocus, then you see, okay, again, we have our under focus image here. Oh, yeah, good, I forgot something. We have to go back up all the way, sorry. Look at the ideal rays. Here, we have an under-focused image. So here's the sample, here's the focus. So we have an under-focused image. If we go for the actual one, this was in focus, but the ones further out the rays will give us an over-focused image. So in the center, we have an under-focused image. And up here, we have an over-focused image. Here we have an under-focused image. If you take a full transformation of that inner part, you will find your tone rings. So this is a phase contrast image that you have here. And if you defocus it far, far enough, you will actually um, be able to align your Huh? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Uh, so you just select the small area here and do a Fourier transformation. Okay, let's look at the uh, questions in, in the moment here. So we have an under-focused image here that we can use for aligning our microscope if we want to. And of course, uh, even more, uh, important, you can look at the the gram itself, which tells us a lot about our operations here. And under focus, we have them separated out, the uh, axial and the radial one. You can see the axial ones actually have always, uh, radial ones have this radial streaks out from the center, and it can become very complicated, right? Once we have that, we can go, and this uh, does not come across very well here in uh, in in, um, in the GitHub uh, in in Colab. So there's a lot more in in here. So you have different defocus values depending on the aberrations, and you have different resolutions. Then, so you get a bit better resolution in say microscope. So here. If we make the probe, all we do is we take our rongigram, actually our faceplate, put an aperture here, we have very little defocus here, of course we have no 
astigmatism. We look at our field of view, two nanometer. And then we get a relative ugly probe. Uh, and that is all the residual magnification, uh, uh, all the residual aberrations that we have here. But look at the distances here, right? So the full width half maximum is about half an angstrom. So it looks ugly. We have a lot of differences in, uh, diff we have a lot of tails and, and oscillations here, but uh, say full width half maximum is actually in the sub angstrom uh, part. We can do that all together and then we get our aberrations and our probe. And with this probe, we know very well. So here's our face plate with the aperture that we're using. And then this over here is our probe that we're getting. And the only thing we did here is transformation, Fourier transformation. If we make this one constant, this one will be the area disk function. So the aberration function is basically a modification of your area disk function to get the probe. And the probe shape will then determine how good and how what, what kind of contrast you get. Again, the idea of the aberration corrector is to have a lot more intensity in a smaller angular distribution or spatial distribution. Okay. Uh, so with the Ronchigram, we have a convenient tool to determine all the parameters that we need. If you have a strongly under or over-focused image, you go to closer, to, to higher magnification, so you either focus or raise the sample uh, to the position that you need with the higher magnification. So that's very easy to understand now, right? And uh, if the operations are completely done as well as you can, you can get directly from the aberrations your probe size. This is what we will use in the simulation because then we can fold that on top of our object function. Um, it's never perfect, but we want to try to get it as close to perfect as possible. So that's it from me with uh, the different parts of the imaging and the information of that. Next time we will talk about uh, atom position, strain analysis, and so on. Let's see what's in the chat, whether we have some questions here. We had some coming up. I'm not sure whether I can contribute to any of that. Okay, what did I do? Am I gone again? You can see me. I don't. Oh, here we are. Still here, but I cannot. Ah, I cannot see the chat. Hold on a bit. Okay, chat. Oh, here's just a lot of stuff going on <laughs> and I cannot contribute here, hold on. Where is my, I don't see my mouse. Hmm. I don't hear anything from Sergei, maybe he can help. Double check here what's going on. Okay. 
in the chat. Hey, some people are signing off. Ah, here we are. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, okay. Ah, here we are. Okay. So let's see whether we have some questions. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. So here's a GitHub question. Definitions. Can diffraction pattern be analyzed by machine learning? Uh, yes, of course. So that's the idea behind it. Uh, we're gonna be doing more and more of that. Uh, okay. Okay, and that is as much as I can see here. So if there are no other questions, and I thank everybody. Okay, well, something is not quite right. Okay, no other questions as far as we can see. So thank you for listening. And uh, as I said, next time we talk about image stacks and then we can quantify uh, interatomic distances, strain and, uh, and other things. And we'll do that with uh, graph theory. Okay, thank you so much. We can close that. <laughs> Just... Yes.